The increasing pace of change, costly security threats, the pressure to build better products faster. This is what happens in an era of constant disruption. You've heard the buzzwords that try to explain it, but you don't need another reminder that building a winning technology strategy is tough. You live it. You need to discover and develop the brilliance within your company and move faster than your competitors. That's why we built Pluralsight. Pluralsight is the technology learning platform that helps you solve problems and develop skills at scale. Companies around the world count on us to stay on the cutting edge. With thousands of courses from leading experts available anytime, anywhere, your teams can deliver on your business goals by closing their skills gaps in critical areas like cloud, security, mobile, design, and data. It's all about putting the right people on the right projects. Our skill assessments and analytics help you uncover knowledge gaps and understand skill levels so you can move forward with the right teams in place. Trend and usage analytics keep those teams aligned to business objectives while highlighting future opportunities. But learning only counts if it helps you reach your goals faster. Channels can help a lot. Whether you're switching tech stacks or onboarding new hires, channels allow you to focus learning for your teams. It's your way to rally people around the trends and technologies your company depends on. But what happens when your teams get stuck? I mean, really stuck. Productivity goes down. Deadlines are missed. With Pluralsight, your employees can capture breakthrough moments with notes and search course transcripts to find the fastest and most reliable answers. It's all to give you confidence that your business can deliver and innovate today, that you can successfully navigate disruption and your teams can keep up that together you can create the future. Great. Uh, so at Pluralsight, we've embarked on the journey to create a thorough, robust infrastructure and implement the necessary tools and strategic efforts to enable self-service business intelligence. A data catalog that can provide value add from governance and security is one of our core focuses. At Pluralsight, we rely on data as a strategic advantage and is imperative to our hyper growth and recent IPO success. Strategic decisions are made from data in Tableau dashboards. These are so imperative, they are literally called run the business. However, as we grow across data practitioners, customers, product sophistication, and sellers, ever more data flows into our environment. The complexity and breadth of data can be both a challenge, can be a challenge, as more data is not necessarily human friendly or digestible. So since this is a Tableau conference, I decided to do my slide in Tableau. Um, but so I'm on the data team. Uh, there's a couple of us in the audience as well. Um, in a nutshell, our role at Pluralsight is to is to connect an ever growing population of users. I, we've I think doubled in size in the last year, with an increasingly complex and larger data set in a way that's meaningful and, and without friction. Our tool of choice for that is Tableau. Um, all of our KPIs that executives look at every, every week are currently in Tableau. As Greg mentioned, we actually have a run the business Tableau dashboard. Um, but unfortunately, in our current state, um, there's a lot of friction, a lot of places that sort of uh, hinder the process being really smooth and joyful. Um, what this is shows is just sort of and I'm not going to go through all of this, but um, kind of where we are today and where we're heading and why this idea of a unified view of data is critical to getting to where we want to go. Um, so there's a number of things that happen today that really are not optimal in the Tableau environment. You've got Tableau desktop users who are connecting to our large data lake um, directly through Tableau, and so they, there's no documentation. So they are you know, using tribal knowledge to actually connect to it, um, often making the wrong joins, pulling in more data than they need, which results in bad work for performance. They're pulling in not enough data or the wrong data, inconsistent data. So all of that just becomes, and it snowballs as more people join the company and use Tableau. Um, as a public company, user permissioning is increasingly important. Before, it wasn't as much of an issue. And so with individual users applying permissions to all their workbooks and their data sources, again, that's inconsistent produces an unreliable environment for the consumers of those dashboards. Um, and then what's probably most heartbreaking for me as a Tableau user is that because of the fact that not everybody has Tableau access, 
um, at least not desktop, and they're using dashboard that are creating for them, um, it's not perceived as a self-service tool. It's something you have to go and order. Um, I don't know if any of you were in the, one of the conferences about five, six years ago where Christian Chabot talked about the high priests of analytics, this idea that people would go to this group and, and request a dashboard and then they'll get something delivered to them and that could take days, weeks. That sort of happens in some respects still. I mean, where people, so there's the, so the people will go off and use other tools because they don't view Tableau as a self-service environment. So what we're, what we're doing is we're trying to address all of those with really a, a, a process where we're able to curate um, key data sources, push them out to Tableau server, and then apply role-level security, uh, commenting, just organizing it for particular use cases, and then letting users, uh, well, first off, building all of our existing dashboards off of those, but then letting users connect directly to those and thereby have a more consistent experience, get it, its, its, its permission properly. Um, so as an example of kind of data people will be looking for is, um, you know, there's a lot of pipeline information in salesforce.com, but then there's a bunch of subscription and user data that's in, in um, Hadoop. Those are not, you know, easily brought together. So we will take on that, that process of creating those connections, those joins, adding the appropriate context, and then pushing that out. And then once we've got a, a, a sort of a catalog or a library of certified curated data sources, we can also address various performance issues by pushing a lot of this complexity upstream, say in a tool like, like a tool like Alteryx, um, and then rolling out web authoring, which is something we haven't done yet at Pluralsight really, but we, like, we want to because as our user base grows, we're not gonna give everybody a tablet desktop license. So if we can get more people using web authoring, um, that hinges on there being a library of reliable, certified, curated data that they can connect to. Um, and so that's really the journey that we're going on to, to support this ever-growing user base that we want to have them use Tableau because we see the power of the tool, but right now it's a bit handicapped by some of the problems we have from our just crazy growth over the last year even um, with both people and data. Cool. So I'm Fernando, and I'm on the engineering team, our data engineering team at Pluralsight. I wanted to provide a little bit of insight into the kind of engineering and infrastructure that's going on underneath Tableau that we're working on to address, I think, some of the both advantages of having a lot of data, but also the challenges of managing that data from the perspective of visualization and analytics. So one of the things we realized early on um, in our data journey at Pluralsight is that collecting the data that we are generating is a strategic imperative. We have to understand what's happening in the product, what's happening across our operating units like sales and marketing. And we knew that if we weren't gathering all of that data in a single place, we would just be throwing it on the floor and losing out on the strategic insights that are essential for us to make critical business decisions and product innovation. So the first step in our journey was constructing a data lake. We use S3 because we like it as an object store. And so starting at the level of our product, um, we use a microservices architecture, which means that every piece of the product is like an independent atomic unit that has its own database and its own schema and its own way of organizing data. So our data lake is cramming 50 different databases into a single store, as well as capturing messaging from our Kafka cluster and from our rabbit messaging queue. And that's just within the product. So you already have hundreds of different types of data that exist as a corner of the data lake. In addition to that, we're gathering things like Adobe Analytics for web analytics segment and then all the other kind of logos that you see on the screen. And then what that results in is, or the first step of that was just all the engineering effort to collect and store everything. When you have thousands of messages a minute and really terabytes of data coming off of our products and each of the interactions of our users. And because the first step of that was just how do I store everything, we ended up with this data lake that had various file formats, various file sizes, and it's really not a friendly thing for Tableau. It's good at many things, but joining gzip to JSON and having it run quickly is not like in the core competencies of a Tableau dashboard. So when you look across all the different ways that we stored data, we realized that we were starting to gather everything and we had our arms around the data that was available. But what we hadn't done was presented it in both a way that's consumable by a Tableau dashboard, but also in a way that users understand kind of the quality and provenance and lineage of that data. And so what we started doing and what we're doing today is we use kind of namespace and tribal knowledge to identify what the most important parts of data are. So that means either if the database has underscore prod in it, it's probably trustworthy. Or if Mike tells you, hey, query this one because I think it's a good table, that's the way that you know that it's quality data. 
And that's kind of continued to get us along the path of being able to use this vast amount of data that we've collected, but it's not scalable. And one of the things that we realized along our data journey is that kind of this concept of I need to gather everything and have a way of processing it using big data tools like Spark and Hadoop is kind of antithetical to the journey of the, an analyst or someone that's providing business intelligence because they have to understand the data and have a mental model of how do I create a visualization that helps the business understand what's happening in the tech stack or um, in the activities of like sales and marketing. And so as my team was more successful at gathering more of the data that our business was throwing off, it actually made every day working in Tableau that much harder for the analysts that look at the data lake and see hundreds or thousands of databases and tens of thousands of tables where um, you're looking and using Hadoop tools to actually feed data into Tableau. And so we'd begun kind of partitioning off part of that data lake and saying this is the trustworthy region, but realized that we were using like MapReduce to push data into Tableau. And that didn't have the efficiencies that I think a business intelligence person should expect from a data environment. Because really, we'd built the tools in the data lake to aggregate and to process like terabytes of data, as opposed to how do I shove rows into a Tableau dashboard to provide an analytics that like, our executive team can consume. Because frankly, they don't care like, how big my Hadoop cluster is if their Tableau dashboard is small. And so we realized that there was a division in the needs of those parts of the business. And so the next step in our data journey, and if you can take me over. Oh yeah, cool, thanks. So the next step on our data journey is really separating those environments of how do I think about the data lake and then the other environments more, that's more consumed by the entirety of the business. And there's two main initiatives that we're pursuing to make that happen. The first one is constructing a data warehouse. And that data warehouse is like a compute environment and infrastructure that's specifically dedicated to business users and to loading things like Tableau. So it has a nice data model. It has tables and joins that are optimized for querying and it's lifted out of the data lake that we've created for aggregating all of those different pieces. Um, the other initiative that we're pushing forward on is we're, beginning, we're building a data catalog of how do we index and create like, not only metadata, but things like descriptions and provenance and lineage about all of that data that's in the warehouse and in the lake. As I mentioned that, and Greg can attest to this, right now our data catalog is the main data Slack channel, as in, like, hey, where did this come from? Or is this data trustworthy? And it's just a group consensus on what key tables we can use within our data lake. And so what we realize is that if we can have a programmatic way of storing that documentation and I'll have it be searchable over the top of our data warehouse, we'd offer like a scalable solution for anyone that's consuming elements of our data. And so we think that putting together this catalog and creating a warehouse that's that curated and stable environment that's specifically dedicated to analytics and business intelligence and discrete from the warehouse is the next step that's gonna allow us to have like a really efficient and like pleasurable data environment for analytics. Because I think the real overall goal of this is how do we go from 80% of our time understanding our data and finding the right trustworthy data as to 80% of our time, like how do I create the analytics that really matter? And I think the, the main takeaway from that is there's specific environments and tools that should be dedicated to things like data curation and documentation. And there's not like a one size fits all toolkit that will work for companies like ours that are experiencing the kind of volume, velocity, and variety of big data. We're having all kinds of formats, lots of data landing at the same time. And that's not, like I said before, in, an intuitive and easy to experience data environment for someone's creating analytics. Great, so are there any questions from you guys? Yeah, yeah, and I think the way we're looking at it is that the data lake is scheme on read. So it's really just how do I land things as quickly as possible and make sure that we're not losing anything uh, pulling in from the variety of systems. And then the data warehouse is a scheme on, on write environment where we have a data model and we're pulling things out of the data lake and lifting it into a, a scheme on write environment so that it can take advantage of like I don't know. So that way we have like efficient sharding in the data warehouse and we're able to do things like divide fact tables across nodes and whatnot for more efficient querying. And so I think the, the short answer is both. Um, and it really depends on what our goals are. Because I think that was where one of the big learnings that we had as we were constructing this data environment is that there's no one tool or one size fits all for everything. It's the different paradigms of like, to your point, scheme on read and scheme on write are, uh, are useful and applicable in different scenarios. 
And so the first step is like, what are you trying to accomplish? And if you're just landing data and you're trying to store everything, you definitely want a schema on write environment. Because the worst case scenario is I'm feeding in lots of like JSON data from the product, as an example, and the schema changes. If I have a schema on write paradigm, I just start losing messages. And for me, I'd rather not understand the messages and figure them out later than just not collect them in the first place. But when you have a data warehouse environment where you have the business relying on the schema that um, you've declared or the trustworthiness and usefulness of the data, I would actually rather have the data not land than it land in an incorrect fashion. Because the worst thing in the world is I send up a table that everyone think is trust, thinks is trusted and it actually doesn't match the schema that I've declared or the, rule, or the business rules I have around the generation of that data. So that's how we look at it, is like, what's the goal? And is it worse for me to not load data, or is it worse for me to have data that's different than I expected? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's another good question because I mentioned before like the sort of cross-purposes nature of collecting all of the big data and then having a pleasant environment for analysts. The other thing that's working, that is kind of working against each other is this concept of democratization of data and then governance. And then as we've become a public company and have to worry about things like insider trading and the blacklist, it's imperative that we're good at protecting data and making sure that only the right people can see the right um, the right elements of the data that we have available. And so that's actually one of the ways that the catalog is being really helpful for us, is that we can use that as a map across everything. Because the way we think about kind of provisioning access is we use Workday. And so we have groups of employees in Workday that kind of declare what rights the, the user should have to data. And so, and if you think about the people team that's provisioning Workday access, they're not intuitive or familiar with the data environment. So if we're able to map things like groups of data to within the data catalog that's intuitive for someone on our people team to understand, they can map that onto the groups of users that they're creating on the Workday side. And so that's how we think about it, is use single sign-on provision access with our like HRIS system, and then use something like a data catalog that's actually, and that we're using Unifies from the logo up there, that has like a good conceptual map of how do I think about provisioning access, but mapping it to a way that like our people team can understand, how do I group these users and what data should they see? Yeah, so when I think about architecture, there's kind of two underlying principles that I try to drive towards so that we're satisfying the business. And the first one is storage is the only thing that's permanent. So in our data environment, we use infrastructure as code for building things. So you can kind of create and destroy as you need new resources. And really the only fixed piece of that is the data lake. And so things like a data warehouse on top of it is just like temporary compute that you spin up to offer an environment for the business. And so I understand now that the needs of the business might not be the needs of the business in the future. So I need to have infrastructure that's flexible to, you know, maybe you want Redshift or Snowflake or whatever that I'm able to understand that I have a fixed permanent storage layer in the data lake, and then everything else on top of it is a temporary resource that's responding to the needs of the business. Um, that doesn't directly answer your question about how we engage with the business, and that's really like a partnership between Mike and I. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about like, what, is he, what is the goal and what are we trying to create for the business, and then us working together to infer the right architecture to answer those questions. But at the end of it, it's engineering being flexible to the fact that the needs of the business will change forever, and so will the data that we're collecting. Mike, um, can you talk a little bit more about self-service and what you envision the future for your customers to look like? Well, like I mentioned, I mean, we want to move, again, if we want to leverage the tablet infrastructure more than, than we do today, we want to have more people.
does is we try to provide that bridge between the, just the vast amounts of, of just raw data and what the different users will need for different use cases. And so that will result in, in you know, dozens potentially of, of different data sources that are designed for certain kinds of analysis that people can then tap into as needed um, and, and, do their, and do their ad hoc analysis on as well service. But it's also going to be consistent with permission, so we know that you know, they're only going to see what they're supposed to see based upon that, that, um, that sort of workday slash, like in, like, like in one case what we're doing to sort of modify the workday piece is that if, if you're in the sales organization, your territory assignments in salesforce.com dictate what you should see, not just where you sit. So there's kind of a blending of, of logic that makes sure that everyone who connects to Tableau server sees what they're supposed to see, but it's based upon the type of role they are, right, in the organization. Very cool. And we help you. Oh, is there a question? Time will tell, obviously, but I think what we're finding, so my, my personal experience is that um, while the idea of democratized data, like I can just connect to anything at any time, sounds good, but if you're frustrated in that effort, if you connect to something you don't trust, that you don't know what's in it, you don't know if it's complete, just the fact that you can connect to it really does help, right? So if we can then um, sort of stand behind the data that they're connecting, they know that there's a, you know, there's a face behind it, question they know who, who, who created it and that we're nimble enough to like say if this happens all the time I mean we'll have a data source out there it's great but then something changes they need to add something or, or there's a new data set that's been produced that has to be joined up really quick if we can turn that around really quickly it's fine that we're the gatekeeper if you will right because then they're still getting a very trustworthy data source that they could continue to use as they need to or not impeding their self service all the visualizations the ad hoc stuff they can do to their heart's content, but we've governed it and we've certified it, right? If we stand behind it, does that make sense? Yeah. It, se it seems to be working so far. Yeah. Our, our tool selection has also been sort of strategic for that purpose. So the catalog is great for governance and um, discovery of PII and security, as well as the maturing environment. So did I cut you off, Fernando? Oh, I was just going to say, I think the way we think about it is like a, in, in terms of the pendulum between full access and governance is also like what is the trade-off between risk and reward? And as your tool set gets better, you can actually mitigate the risk of offering more data. Because when you think about the risks of giving all your data to everyone, things are like I make the wrong conclusions because I didn't understand the data. Or security concerns of I shared something that's PII or, or what have you. And so some of those risks you can mitigate just by providing more context about what the data is. And so what we're trying to slide towards is how do I offer more things to more people because I've mitigated those risks with the tools I'm using. Some things you know, I'll never mitigate the risk of, like that table that has all of our employees' social security numbers in it. That's probably never going to make it in a Tableau dashboard. But as long as I have the tools that are going to restrict access in a fine-grained way, that allows me to offer more to the rest of the business. And so it's really, like as we work together, how do I push that risk curve as far down as possible? so that I can extend the amount to which we're democratizing data. And there's even, a, I mean, a topic we're discussing still in terms of, you know, Tableau will always be the only tool people will use. And so if we could set up a situation where if they connect to a data source in Tableau, but there's also an equivalent version of that data source in the warehouse, either, that, either that's feeding directly into the, or that's what the Tableau source feeds from, or both come from the same upstream process, then if you're a you want to connect directly with SQL, that's fine, but you're going to be getting the same view of that data that you would if you were hitting the Tableau. Because they're coming from a similar, from the same pipeline, right? Because then that just minimizes, it allows us to scale and minimize the maintenance and just the, obviously the, the inconsistency we want to avoid that doesn't happen today when there isn't that same kind of consistent pipeline. Does that make sense? Yeah.
say you're the deal. So today they are, so that you might change that. Well, it's a combination. So we're providing a lot, and there's been a lot that's been created by individual users up to this point. And so, like just as an example, like some of the things that we're dealing with is because of these individual connections, sometimes, I mean, the skill level varies wildly. So I mean, you can have someone who's capturing the data source, pulls back a ton of data, they only need a sliver of it, their workflow is horrible in terms of performance. People complain, they complain to them, they complain to us, and so if we're able to, to show them that if we you know, push a bunch of calculations upstream, create an extract, minimize the number of columns that are pulling back in the rows, et cetera, then the dashboard is much, much better. They're happier, the users are happier, right? And so in that situation, they're not, they're fine with us taking on that part. And, and, and also it just, you know, we don't necessarily want 10, 12 people or 100 people connecting to the same data set and pulling back a more or less redundant version because it's, I mean, and then of course where the catalog would come in is that if I'm a new Tableau desktop user, then I don't really know what already exists. I mean, I can go on Tableau server and search, but I may not know what those data sources contain because there's no comment, there's no, there's no documentation, there's no metadata necessarily around them. They're just raw data sets. Um, so if they can then see, A, these are created by the data team, for example, and we know where these come from, how often they're refreshed, what are the other kind of rules are applied, then it makes it much easier for them to know, I'll just start here, as opposed to thinking I have to build my own from scratch, right? Yeah, I think that's exactly the right point that we've been working to identify is, it's not so much a perspective of how do I create restrictions around what people can do, it's offering a path of least resistance that takes them to the right answer. So I think to Mike's point about how helpful the catalog would be is that if I'm interested in revenue or retention or name a metric, if I'm able to index a list of analysis that's been done in trusted sources, and that's my first step, as opposed to throwing some queries at the wall and hoping I get something back useful, then you have a better experience for your analytical users, and the path of least resistance is the trusted data store. And so I think that, that path of organization is really how we're thinking about getting people to the right answers and not restricting access, but making sure that the right answer is also the easiest answer to get to. Is that clear? Oh, we'll call on you in one second, but just the idea of the uh, foundational trusted data sources increasing productivity by reducing redundancy and rework and removing the reliance on tribal knowledge. Cool, that's good, we can just call it. Uh, sorry. We are absolutely still in the process of it, um, and it's, it, it, it involves, I think what is the least fun is cross-team cross collaboration, um, or the most fun for me. Um, Writing and, a slip, right? Right. <laughs> uh, where working with the end users to understand where data is brought in, molded, melded, mixinized, uh, and then also the teams that create or in, um, ingest the data. So it's trying to start from the beginning and the end, and then working toward the middle to create consistent documentation. Yeah, so, uh, please. Yeah, there are a couple levels that we started at. And one was because we began with the data lake, and so we used to do, and that way we have a hive metastore that understands all of the data that we've landed in the lake for the most part. And so we kind of had these two ends to Greg's point of the spectrum of one, I have a meta store with almost everything that I've collected and landed. Um, we had this conversation about schema on read versus schema on write before. And so as we're landing major data sources, we use crawlers to do our best to identify schema and then check that into the meta store. But what's missing is the context for the, from the business. And so that's the conversations with as we were prioritizing different efforts of documentation, what are the core data sets of the company? And then meet with that team and understanding that most of the important information is stored in tribal knowledge, how we push that into a system. But I think those were the two ends of doing our best to aggregate this lake and create some idea of schema over the top of it, and then pushing that schema into, what we did was we ingested it with Unify, and then uh, use that like wiki functionality to drive conversations with teams. And it's a slog for sure, because you're talking to dozens of individuals or hundreds of individuals across your company. But you kind of do it once and then it's upkeep. Any sort of setbacks with lessons learned, like if you did it again, you would have started this way, or you pulled a few people, or anything? 
Yeah, a, th a few things. I mean, we, we spent a year looking for the right catalog solution and tested a handful where we deployed them in the environment and see what was available. I'd say the first, and obviously this is a truism, but understand what you're trying to accomplish. And for us it was, can you talk to the head meta store? Can you crawl Tableau? Are you able to create some type of analytical artifact for things on Shiny server from our data science team? And so it's, we had these like core requirements. And then from there it was, what user interface did we want it? How do we want people to engage with it? And in parallel with that, we were still undertaking efforts of cataloging in whatever format teams already had. So there's Google Sheets or Docs or whatever, beginning to pull that information into a single just like repository of, here's the, like the data lake of tribal knowledge, essentially. And so then as we put those efforts together, it was beginning to structure it in a way that we could push into our ultimate catalog solution. And so I think that's how we looked at it, is how do we get the engineering right to gather it? And then how do we map that on to the requirements that we have for a tool? Yeah, of course. Uh, sound fantastic. Um, are there any other questions? Or should we just keep chatting about data? Cool, yeah. Tools? Um, great, so in terms of the uh, reliance on tribal knowledge, what do you think is the, the main takeaways to, for the catalog? You had mentioned that the, the most vital pieces will exist in Slack now. Do you have any perspective or thoughts on what, I guess maybe to the question in the back, are the, the key considerations we should keep? Yeah, so I think a couple things. And one was that comment I made about making the right answer be the path of least resistance. Because right now, because that like, data Slack channel that we have is kind of the source of the provenance and lineage, uh, if you were exploring a new data set, it's pretty easy. I just drop a Slack on this channel and hope that someone gets back to me with that, what I also hope is the right answer. And so then when we're looking for a catalog solution, it's like, how do I offer something that has that same low barrier to entry? So it's easy for a user to engage with it. You don't want it to be, like, have a slow user interface or be hard to search for data. So you need to have solid search and good indexing of everything that's available. But it's really like, how do I have the path of least resistance to the right answer? So, you are, so essentially, what we were competing with was, how do I have a better answer than what you can get just by slacking people you hope know what's going on? I think also it's um, kind of a low barrier for our definition of done. Is it who built it? What does it do? Is it maintained? Is it derived? If it is, what is it derived from? And frankly, who, who, to, who to talk to if it's not working? Yeah, that's another important piece of the process is what do we consider completed documentation? Because that's a forever treadmill of what's the right answer and how do I know enough about this data set? So it was partnering with the business to determine like when you're looking at a data table, what are the three or four or five or whatever things do you absolutely have to know to know enough about it to work with it? And so it's identifying that, to Greg's point, definition of done of what is sufficient documentation for us? Well, and it's also just our, our ongoing um, partnership with different business teams. I mean, as, as we see, as we prepare data for them and see how they use it, we stay, you know, it's not like a case where we just like build it and throw it over the wall. I mean, we're very much engaged with them on a week to week basis. So we can see the kinds of things that they're trying to do, um, the kind of questions they start asking, and then we're able to, you know, as partners with Fernando's team, see what might else you guys want to discuss? It's been so comprehensive. And yeah, one of the big things for us has been GDPR compliance. And so we actually started an office in Dublin at the beginning of this year. And that's one of our kind of core areas for future growth. And so what that's involved, um, I think at the earliest stages, was partnership with the security team of actually defining requirements around what existed. And then the next piece is 
do I have a good enough meta store and understanding of the data that I'm storing that I can actually identify the different sources of like restricted data? And then what's the process for actually cleaning? Because one of the things that I mentioned is our underpinning like beliefs about the data lake is store everything forever. It doesn't really work well if you're trying to satisfy compliance. And so I think it's identifying that right, um, that right way to identify what needs to be cleaned and then what processes you have to ensure that um, that you're actually complying with uh, anonymization or what have you that's required. And what we try to do is we take the requirements from the security team but then partner with the owners of the data. Because one of the other beliefs we have about our storage layer is the things that I'm storing should match the source data as closely as possible. So if we're able to trust that Salesforce is anonymizing when it should and the product is anonymizing when it should, we're actually taking that data and reflecting it in the lake. And so we do have kind of secondary processes that look for offenders or what have you. But it's really like, how do I partner with the people that are the data sources? Because my primary goal is store a copy of everything forever so that they're, they're cleaning. And because we're a central point of storage for everything, we're a good platform to understand what exists in the environment. And the catalog has automated features to identify PII. So I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I would recommend chatting with the Unify team about that. It is kind of nifty. Yeah. Has anyone else implemented a catalog, or do you guys have one, or want one? Yes. Want one? Yeah. Yeah, and I think one thing to, one other thing we realized in terms of lessons learned is the technology matters a lot, but so does like your company's intestinal fortitude to actually push through all the work that it's going to take. Because you can have a great party, but if no one shows up, it doesn't matter. And I think that that's one of the things that, um, as any of you embark on the cataloging journey, understanding the amount of work it's gonna take, and essentially half or more of your job is just coordinating with the teams uh, to ensure that we are working towards documentation. Because it's one of those things that is extra to everyone's existing job. And so you're basically asking for lots of work from a team that's already, in all cases, very busy. And so the way that, one of the concepts that we have at Pluralsight is agreements, of making agreements with other teams, and then working towards satisfying those agreements. So part of the underpinning was, how do I form agreements with the owners of data so that I can rely on them in the future to work with me to provide documentation? Because it's hard and not fun and lots of work and many conversations. And so I think that's something else to be aware of at the outset, of actually what you're embarking on. Because the worst thing in the world is you install software and then no one works on it and it's just, it's, it's kind of a barren wasteland in six or eight months and everyone wonders where this awesome data catalog solution that you've been talking about went. Right. And it's, it's sort of a standard eating the elephant exercise where it's one bite at a time. And so there are many teams that we haven't even engaged yet. We're, we're trying to start with a narrow, get some narrow wins under our, our belt, I should say narrow, but really significant and important data sets, but from specific teams at a specific time so that it can compound but also be effective. Yeah, and I think the other point is that path of least resistance concept that we talk to each other about a lot. It's like, how do I make it participating in the data catalog easier than answering all those questions on Slack about your data? Because ultimately, people respond to incentives. And so how do you create the right incentives in the technology that you're deploying so that the thing that you've built is better than what was happening before? Because no one responds well to, hey, you can't use that stop. I, this is the thing that you have to do now. It's more like this is an easier solution and be the path of least resistance. Well, and part of what I'm also uh, interested in finding out that is very communicated and concerning is how to capture like documentation organically of like what, where it's happening. Like as an example, like, well, you know, our team uses Altrix a lot to process data and prepare it. So we're putting a lot of, you know, we'll comment the workflows, we'll add logic to the workflows. If we have to that somewhere else, it's never going to happen. So if we can ingest that content, and it should be possible because everything is XML, and so if we can then move that into the catalog and say, this is an alternate for your data set, this is, the, this is the logic and commentary that the author of that workflow created, then when they make that change, it organically just automatically flows into the catalog. There's no need for extra maintenance because that prior job, the instant you guys do two things, it's dead, right? So we don't want to go down that path because it won't scale. Uh, well, Unify is, has, it's all very, still very new. 
So we are using Alteryx, for example, to collect data from um, the data lake and then prepare it for Tableau Server. And then we'll also that often write a copy of that data back to, the, to Hadoop for, for those who want to use SQL. But then at least they're using the same sort of output data source from a single Alteryx workflow. And then that way if you make changes, it happens in one place and then it flows into both, right, at the same time. So that's, that's a big part of just what we're, you know, just minimizing the number of redundant pieces makes a huge impact because it allows us to scale. We can then have, you know, way more data sources that are maintained by a s relatively small team um, and we can still be very nimble in responding to uh, increasing user requests. Yeah, um, what do you mean by which technologies? Like what we're using for? I thought, I thought oh yeah, so basically what we use is, we use S3 for the storage layer. So any of the objects that we're storing is in an, an S3 data lake bucket that we have. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, to work with that data, um, we use temporary like, Hadoop clusters. So we'll spin up a cluster to like copy data across and land it, or pick it up and convert it to another format. But it's not actually an HDFS. We use S3 as a storage layer underneath, uh, underneath uh, temporary Hadoop clusters. Yeah, and so that way we can use Spark or Hadoop or whatever, and it just picks up and drops back to the lake. So anything that we have in HDFS is like a temporary um, solution for working before landing it back in the lake. And that's currently how the catalog reads the Altrix processes, it's through the Hadoop cluster. So on the catalog you can see Altrix Eng or the prod, Sorry, what, what do you call it? Alteryx Sandbox. Right, the Sandbox, but there are <laughs> prod versions of your run the business in there can be found via the catalog. Oh yeah, I guess one more nuance on if, uh, to understand better what we're doing. We have temporary clusters, but we have a persistent Metastore. So usually you have like the Metastore living on the master node of your Hadoop cluster. And so what we actually did was we pulled that Metastore out to a separate long-standing RDS. And so we'll spin up clusters that talk to the Metastore and then shut them down. But we have a central place that stores all of the metadata. Um, and then that's what talks to our data catalog. So we have this like persistent metadata store that's independent of any of the clusters that we're running. Uh, oh, so the Hive, um, yeah, so to take a step back, the Hive Metastore is essentially just a database that has a record of all of the data that is stored um, and accessible to your data lake. Yeah, so essentially it's just uh, like a rows and tables of, here's the table definition, here's the location of the data in S3, so that way Hadoop can talk to the Metastore and say, hey, where's this table and where are the objects that constitute that, that table? Yeah. Great. Uh, I guess we'll be around for a little bit afterwards as well, but it looks like we're getting close on time. Cool. Yes, no, maybe? Great, well yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Great Thanks. to talk about what we're working on. Yes.